How many remember the movie Forrest Gump? Great little movie, right? Do you remember how that movie started? Anybody remember? He's sitting on the park bench talking to a, right. a nurse. Right. And what happened shortly after? Even before that, maybe. Uh, here's the problem. I thought, I didn't think ahead enough to bring in the, uh, the actual movie. I tried to do it out there. Well, guess what? It's one you get in DVD. You can't do it online without going through hoops. So anyway, what I remember from that, and your hand just gave me a clue, right? was there's a segment, and maybe it's in the introduction before that scene, I'm not sure. But there's a scene where you see this uh, big, big scene. Who just said feather? Feather. All right, there's a feather. What, what do you remember about that feather? It's floating. And it's floating in the air, beautiful music behind it. Imagine that that's what I'm showing you, OK? And it comes on down, and it floats on down, and it lands on a guy's shoulder, remember? And what happens then? Did he pick up that feather? No, he's not there yet. This is somebody waiting, getting on a bus. Okay? And so it falls off his shoulder. It falls off his shoulder. And eventually it gets blown up and eventually it gets in Forrest Gump's hand. Now, three things have happened already. One, if you don't see the feather, you can't do anything about it. If you do see the feather, you've got a choice to make. And in corporate environments, what I've done with this presentation is actually brought feathers. And we've thrown them over the audience. You just can imagine an executive wing of a big corporation with feathers being thrown around. And everybody sort of looks like, huh, some people pick it up. Okay? Some just totally ignore it. They're focused on whatever. And some people, like Forrest did, took it and hung on to it. And what I'm trying to say is that, to me, is opportunity. Opportunities in our lives all the time, right? We put advertisements out to this leadership summit, okay? A lot of people never even read the note that went out, no matter how we advertise it. They had no chance to take advantage of that opportunity. Others looked at it and said, I don't want anything to do it. So they passed on the opportunity. And then like Forrest Gump, each of you said, well, I think I want to take advantage of this opportunity. And you're here today, okay? And hopefully you're going to back and say, boy, am I glad I grabbed that feather. Okay. And so, like Forrest Gump, we have to make a decision when we see opportunities. And in today's enriched lives and very busy lives that all of you lead, you have more opportunities than you can possibly handle. So, if you're on a cruise ship, Bob and Sue, what's the most, these are cruisers, okay? How many cruises have you done so far? <laughs> That's cruisers, okay? And the most recent one, they took their 16 members of their family on the cruise ship with them. So that's serious cruising. Now, if you think of cruise ships, what do you think of? Water. Huh? Water. Water, okay, it's in water, but when I think of the cruise itself, what's the first thing that comes to mind? What are they known for? Eating. Food, yes! And so you have this concept, I'm not a cruiser, we went on one, one time, and I saw what it's talking about. But you go down to the buffet, right? And here's this buffet of everything under the sun. Do they have what you like? Absolutely, they are someplace. Okay? But there's more than you could possibly choose from. No less eat. And so, what's your limitation? Your decision. I'm sorry? Your decision making. Your decision, yes. But secondly, what's the first thing you got to do when you get that buffet? Choice. Besides looking it over so you know what your choice is going to be. But what's the next thing you got to do? Go get a plate. Now, that plate can't hold all that food, can it? I mean, if you were dying for 20 of those pieces of food, you're not going to put it on that plate. You may come back a second time, yes, but you're limited by the plate. And so once you have the plate, now you're in decision mode. How are you going to choose? What's the first thing you're going to go for? What would you go for? Bob, what did you go for when you went to that buffet? Foods I'm familiar with. Such as? Pick one. I want the food. What's your favorite food? Chicken. Chicken? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. I don't have to go on a cruise to get a chicken. I don't care what they do with that chicken. I'm passing on the chicken. I'm going for shrimp or lobster myself. <laughs> you have a soup, food, seafood allergy. You got a favorite food. What's your favorite food? Lobster. You would find lobster someplace on there, okay? 
And so you put that on your plate, and then you go down to something else, you pick your second favorite, and you start, well, maybe you put a lot of lobster on there, so it wouldn't be much more room. You know, I've done that with shrimp, a little cocktail sauce, some lemons. Ah, no room for other food. Go sit and eat that, come back later. Isn't that like life? Isn't that like life? I mean, we have all these opportunities. We have this buffet of opportunities in front of us. And what's the first thing you have to do? What's your plate? How big is your plate? Day. One day. You got 24 hours. You're going to have to sleep some of that. You got less than 24 hours. Within that plate of 24 hour, you got to find the opportunities you're going to take advantage of, okay? You have a lot of other things going on in your life. You chose to make this opportunity, this trio engagement, this education, this camaraderie a priority. And so you're here. And out of the 24 hours of this day, you're giving this your priority. That's what you picked off that buffet. That's your lobster today. All right? Now, how do you pick out of all these opportunities? We are so blessed with so many opportunities. How do we pick one over the other? Anyway, how do you pick? David? Paper, scissors, rock. <laughs> okay. That's to remind me what's on the next slide. Uh, seriously, how do you, that's one way. You know, well, whatever comes, comes. I guess I'm going this way, right? Uh, you got up this morning, you decided whether you're going down to the hotel lobby to get their breakfast, or you're coming over here to get food, or you stayed in bed an extra 15 minutes, okay? Am I gonna shower, or am I gonna stay in bed another 15 minutes, because man, that meeting ran long last night, you know? Et cetera, et cetera. You made decisions based on priorities. If you were hungry, guess what? You went for the food. Right? If you're really tired, you went to the bed. So how do you make priorities? Which is my whole point. We need to understand what our goals are. And if our goals are to nourish ourselves at that moment, that becomes the priority. And you go for the food. You get up early, you go down there, you get the food. So the most important thing you've got going on in your life is setting your personal goals and having done that, you can make decisions of priority. If your goal is to be giving back to the community because of your transplant as an example, then your priority is getting involved with TRIO or other organizations. And then you make time for the meetings, the events, whatever, or the leadership summits, and you come out. So the key is to know what your goals are. Where does that start? Well, the first thing you're going to do is have an idea. Until you have the idea, you can't make a priority. And so, let me call that idea, it becomes a dream. Out of all the ideas that are floating around your head, you get to a point where you say, you know what? I can picture myself going to Pittsburgh and meeting some of those old friends. Yeah, so it's a dream, okay? Once you make that dream, you wanna make it your goal. So what do you have to do to that dream to become your reality? Anybody? Action. Action, okay? You gotta figure out what steps it's gonna take. If you're not living in Pittsburgh, then the first action is, how much is it gonna cost me for airfare to get there? I gotta make a reservation, I gotta get a ticket, I gotta plan my schedule so that my family knows I'm not gonna be there that day to support my wife with what she's doing as an example, okay? And so you take action steps. The key to successful goal setting is to write those steps down. And if you're like me where thoughts flow so quickly, I gotta write it down quick. Because about five minutes later, I'm saying, well, that? Oh, damn, lost that one again. Anyway, so you write down your action steps, and then what do you do? You've written down the action steps. What are you going to do next? Prioritize. Prioritize. Okay. We're within one goal, one dream that's working toward a goal. You've written it down, so you have steps in order. What does it take next? Take action. Action. You got to do it. Okay. Taking the action creates the reality. So to make your dream become your reality, you need to identify, prioritize, write down, and act. Many people have great ideas. They think they're passionate about something, but they don't act. Guess what? They don't get there. Very frustrating. I know people that will not set goals because they feel a sense of failure when they don't achieve. 
as somebody pointed out in the conversation just the other day, what was important to them was the trip itself, not the destination. Isn't that cool? Yeah, true. Think about some of those goals you've got. You get to the goal and it's like, is that all there is to that? Like look at the time you had, the passion of getting there, the satisfaction of doing it, right? Exactly. Exactly. And so, let me share with you a couple personal examples. That is an old Stearman open cockpit biplane, two sets of wings. One particular year, I, I love reading books, and I was reading a book about uh, somebody's passion for antique planes. I'm sorry, I, let me back up a little bit. I took some time to figure out, in terms of setting goals, what are my passions? What is it that turns me on? What makes me excited about life? And at the time, I was playing with a computer simulation of flight called Flight Simulator. And it even had an adjunct of a uh, air traffic controller module. And I would sit in a dark living room with a radar screen in front of me, <laughs> guiding planes into land at my virtual airport. Okay? or flying planes and you have a choice of planes. And I really enjoyed that. And so I said, all right, why do I enjoy that? You've got to understand yourself first, right? And I said, because I like learning new things. Constantly learning, expanding my horizons by that. And so I said, that, that's what this is all about. What would I do now, given that insight, to fulfill my values? And it became to go up in a small plane, now that I've had the experience of this virtual control of a plane, and see it firsthand. That'd be cool. That'd be the next step. And so I wrote that down in my personal goals. That summer, I'm reading a book about a guy who's passionate about antique planes. By the time I got through reading this book, I said, you know what? I don't want to go up in just any plane. I want to go up in a, an open cockpit plane. Whoa, would that be cool? Oh, it's got to have two wings. Oh, I didn't even know it was called a biplane, okay? So I changed my goal, all right? I want to go up in an open cockpit biplane. Now, a goal, you've got to put a time frame on it. There's no reason for any time frame on this, but that's the principle. And so I put a, a time frame on it. This was like June. I put a time frame on by the end of September. Where the hell did that come from? I have no idea, okay? There's nothing about June to September that made any difference, but I can change the goal later, but I put it on there. Now, here's the dangerous part of this whole process. You have a subconscious mind that is the majority of your thinking power. It's like 95% of your thinking power. You're not even tuned into it. You're working with the 5% up here today. I got my water. I'm listening to Jim. That's your 5%. 95% is still working in the background. When you drove here, if you came from Pittsburgh, for example, and you came from a far distance in Pittsburgh, I doubt if you thought too much about that drive. You stopped at red lights. You pause when somebody cuts you off, and you somehow got here. That 95% was your autopilot. And so once you told yourself what I'm doing today, uh, Saturday, oh God, I'm doing that leadership summit. Where the hell is it? Oh, it's core. Okay, I'm not here. That was it. And you forgot about it and you just did it. That's our lives every day, 95%. So here's the problem. Once you set that goal and you write it down, man, you've programmed the computer. You've programmed the autopilot. And so while you're doing everything else, it's say, Jim wants to go up and open cockpit biplane, opportunities, look, look for opportunities. Where the hell am I gonna find an open cockpit biplane? I don't even know where they would be, okay? And I'm talking to somebody else in my corporate environment who's from Atlanta, Georgia. I said, hey, didn't you take one of our directors up in an antique plane or something? Yeah, I said, what, down in Atlanta, right? He said, no, no, it's right up here in Bucks County. Vincent Airport, and I lived nearby that. I said, really? I said, I've got this goal of hope going flying in open cockpit by plane by the end of September. He saw it. He's wanting to be certified on just such a plane, and I will be certified in September. So if you want to go up, I'll take you up. Duh. I got to go up in that plane on a grass airport with no air traffic control. I'm in the front seat. Okay, I've got controls over I'm not touching them. He's the backseat, he's the pilot, he's been the one certified. And you know how much training you must need to pilot a plane, right? I mean, I'm sitting up there, man, I'm, wow, this is really cool. 
They call that plane a tail dragger because the tail is down there and the plane looks up like this. What I didn't know was he can't see in front of us. <laughs> okay, we got radio contact. I've got a literally a bubble tube in front of me with a bubble in it. That's the horizontal uh, controls, okay? So you know it's not, there's no, there's no electronic uh, cockpit screen there. There's something over here. This I was told was the brake. You know, and there's, there's a thing here. I'm not touching that. And so he said, are we good? Are we okay? Yeah, we're fine. Yeah. I didn't know he couldn't see in front of us. He's asking me, should we taxi out? Yeah, sure, by all means, go ahead. <laughs> there's hot air balloons going up. There's gliders flying in. There's planes going out on this grass airport that's totally under control of visual control. And I just gave him the go ahead. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I didn't know it at the time. So we go on up. Hey, this is really cool. The air's rushing past me. I got my earphones on. It's freezing. And we're up there. Wow. Really cool. Talk about feeling passionate about achieving your goal. Oh. He says, <clears throat> look, at the, look at the birds flying down there. And he does it. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, I see them. <laughs> you ready to fly it? Huh? You got the controls. Huh? <laughs> we flew level for about five minutes. I'm not moving a thing, baby, but I was flying the plane. No pilot training of any type. Never been up in one that I was anywhere near the control. We, I flew the plane. <laughs> he said, I'm going to show you some acrobatics. I said, you better not do that, man. I get motion sickness real quick, and you're going to get in the face. <laughs> so we didn't do some of the things he wanted to do. And we came in, and we landed. And uh, he took the controls back, and we, he landed, OK? And so that was my experience. I took pictures, or somebody took pictures of the various stages of that. And I have one of those montages of the prints showing the sequence in the center or something like that. Everybody coming in my office said, oh, you're a pilot? No, 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 no. Well, but you're, I said, I'm not a pilot. I don't want to be a pilot. That's all about setting goals. Okay, setting your goals. Now, here's the danger part. You better be serious about the goal because it's going to happen. For example, as <laughs> far-fetched as this sounds, that one may be sort of reasonable. You say, well, Jim, can everybody find an empty plane to find somebody's going to fly them up there? Sure they can. And so, this is a picture of Bondi Beach outside of Sydney, Australia. Now, why the heck would you want to go there? As a child, I lived in Australia, in Sydney, in the city of Bondi. It's a seashore resort area for about three years from the great age of about eight to ten. What a great place to be as a young kid. And so as an adult, I always had this thing, boy, I wonder what it's like to go back there as an adult. At some point in time, I stopped saying that to myself, and I said, you know, if you're serious, you're going to write that down as a goal and see what happens. And so, again, totally arbitrary, wrote down to go back to Sydney, Australia, and I forget what time frame I put on it. I had no money to go there. I have no justification to go there. I have nothing except a dream. Writing it down, now it's becoming a goal. In one passage within the next month, a good friend of mine meets me in the hallway. He says, oh, by the way, Jim, I want to say goodbye. I'm leaving. I've been reassigned. This is Bluebell, Pennsylvania. I said, where are you going? Australia is the director of customer service. Really? <laughs> Listen, if you ever need some training for project management down there, I'm your man. All you got to do convince my boss to give me the time to do it, pay for the trip, and I'll be glad to come. Four months later, I am in Sydney, Australia. Okay? With my mother, who in her 70s agreed to come along with me, who said, how long are we going for? I said, well, the meeting's on Monday. We can leave Monday or Tuesday morning. She said, we're only going down there for two days. It's a 22-hour flight one way. I said, duh. I'm thinking business meeting, you know. I said, well, if we leave on Thursday and we stretch it on this side, we can get to the next weekend. We end up spending 10 days down there together in an executive apartment with her cooking my home-cooked meals because she loved to do that. She went up a little town, got us local food, you know. I lived the life around. Cost me nothing, all right? The company paid for it, went to business class, great way to go on that long a flight, and got to do something with my mother 
uh, that any child would love to do at that advanced age. Okay? And so that's Bondi Beach. We went back to Bondi Beach. We used to live right up in the corner of this. And guess what? Bondi Beach is a topless beach these days. <laughs> ah, I never saw a topless beach before. My mother's with me. Mom, look, it's a topless. She says, I don't think we should be here. <laughs> I got my video camera out. She says, I don't think you should be taking pictures. But mom, they're waving to me. <laughs> I've got pictures of three topless young ladies waving. And when I got back, I couldn't wait to share that. It could have been on the evening news and nobody would have complained. There were such tiny figures in that video. <laughs> but trip of a lifetime, okay? And so again, as far-fetched of setting that goal would be, that's what I'm telling you, be careful. You set it, your 95% of you are working towards that goal, whatever it was. You're forgotten. Ideally, you take a little card and you put your goal, put it someplace where you see it each day to reinforce it. What I'm telling you is once you write down that goal, 95% of your power is working toward achieving that goal. And it's going to happen. I'm going to give you one more example. Scary example. <coughs> Another kidney pancreas recipient, yes, kidney pancreas, uh, was working for another company nearby our campus, campus company. And so we would carpool down to trio meetings, not the OPO. And we would have a half hour conversation. We got stuck in traffic, we had even more. But we would talk about things, and this is one of my passions, obviously. And so I'm sharing it with her. She is in her late 20s, I think. Uh, she got married, like a 21, to her soulmate. He came down with leukemia. She nursed him through it and he passed away about four years of an ideal marriage, and she lost him. She was hoping to find somebody else in her life. And we're talking about goal setting. I said, well, what you got to do is write that down. Huh, okay. And I said, now, when you write down the goal, make it as real as possible. In other words, describe what he looks like. Describe the type of person he is. Describe his values. So that when you see him, you'll know him. I said, okay. And next time we're carpooling, she says, I did just what you told me. I got it all written down, this and that. I said, what color is his hair? It's brown. What color is his eyes? Blah, blah, blah. You know, just trying to get a good visual so that the subconscious can be working towards something. The next month when I see her, I found him and we're getting married. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I, 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 I launched a, a missile here. You know, how, yeah, exactly. I mean, I, hold on, Faith. You don't, you don't want to just jump in and get married. No, he's the right guy. He matches everything. You know, we've been dating now for a while. Yeah, a month. <laughs> and they're getting married. Long story short, they're still married. And it's been about 15 years now. She has two daughters from him, and he turned out to be a great husband. Now, I would recommend that, <laughs> but she took it to the hilt. And so my challenge to you is, both from an organizational standpoint and a personal standpoint, first come to understand yourself. What are your values? What's important to you? And once you do that, now start thinking about goals in your life. And I've got to share with you that one of the things that I do, I have a personal goal document. Now, this is getting carried away, but, uh, oh, I'm sorry. One of those, I got to go back to Australia a second time, and I got to swim in the Great Barrier Reef off Australia, which is one of the great wonders of the world, and a dream I had, okay? What's fascinating about this, this is not my picture, don't worry about that. I did not go deep in that. I did not little submarine that did though. And uh, I did go snorkeling, you know, with a tube above you. you know. And let me just share with some of you. How many have snorkeled here? Oh wow, that's so cool. <laughs> I, I don't know if you had the same experience. When you have your head in the water and you're breathing, you can hear everything, can't you? You can hear yourself breathing. Yeah. Well, I've got a weakened heart at that point. This is back about 93, got my transplant in 94. So I've got a weakened heart. And one thing the body says when you're underwater and trying to breathe, it says, what are you, crazy? We can't breathe underwater. And so you get a little nervous if you've not been a snorkeler or trained or anything like that. I'm, I'm in this group that's out there on the reef snorkeling, and I'm nervous because I'm trying to breathe underwater. And the heart is going like crazy. I know that. 
but with a weakened heart, it's not clearing the blood out of the lungs fast enough. And when that happens, it starts bubbling in the blood, and you can hear the gurgling when you're underwater like this, right? And so now you think I was nervous before? I'm even more nervous now because I know what's going on. I had this happen before. I've got to get, I got to get someplace where I can just sit down and relax. I'm in the middle of the Great Barrier Reef. Can't even see the cruise ship that took us out there. We're out on a little motor launch out here, and we're in the water with 20 other people. I stand up on the coral. The marine biologist said, "Please don't stand on the coral. It's living coral." I said, "It's either me or it." Are you okay? No, I'm not. No, really. Are you okay? No, I've got a heart condition. Right now, it's acting up. All right. Uh, well, here, let me take your mask, and I'll go back and get the launch. But I have to take everybody with me, because the response were all these gray-headed people. And uh, they go back to the launch. I find myself in the Pacific Ocean, up to here, no sign of land. We're like 20 miles out. I don't know where the ferry is, but it's about 20 miles out. No sign of the ship. I don't know where they were. It's just me and God. And I started laughing. I looked up and said, yeah, okay, got it. Did it this time. <laughs> I guess my friends back in the States are going to really have a laugh when they're at my funeral to say, leave it to Jim. He died on the Great Barrier Reef off Australia. <laughs> and lo and behold, I relaxed. And they came back. I got on the boat, on the little motorboat. I said, I'm fine now. Okay. So they took the, the people back out over the reef. I stayed there. One of the guys was in the water. He was having trouble. I helped him out. He was having the same condition, but he hadn't had the experience before. He didn't know what was going on. God was working several things that day. And so again, just an extension of the story that I had to share with you, which led to the heart transplant the next year. I do maintain a document that I update every year of my personal goals. Yes, it's too long compared to what I'm suggesting you do, but it's based on value statements. If you go to Ben Franklin's autobiography, he lists his values in one sentence statements that says, you know, I am this, and it finishes the sentence with an example of what that would be like in life. And I maintain that document. And so when, as was mentioned by Walter yesterday, my donor family wife lost her 13-year-old son Christopher back in 97. When we got together, I passed on this passion for setting goals and living life that way. And so we maintain a dream book and each year, around New Year's Day, we don't go out partying, we sit down with our green book and our little laptop, we update the year, and we go through all the pages, and we update the pages, what, what are our dreams this year? What would we like to accomplish this year? This past year was to go to the transplant games. Every other year, that's one of our goals, okay? There's a goal that's still been in there five years, and that's to go up to a, a, a mountain cabin or a cabin up in the woods in the fall, where we have a fireplace and some snow outside in the lake nearby. I just recently found a contact of somebody who went to one of those and they're going to give us a contact. We're going to get to do that. Once you put it down there, and this document is a PowerPoint slide presentation, which you're not going to get to see, with about 10 pages to it. And yeah, there's, there's goals in there about getting Chevelle together. Ain't been happening, but it's still there as a goal. And so, put a time, take it to the put street. Put a deadline on that. I'm sorry? I said put a deadline on that. I have. <laughs> More than once. <laughs> you should not be constrained by your goals. It's certainly your, your intention. But don't give up when you get frustrated because that weight didn't stay off. Okay, last time it came off nicely. There was some medical condition. They fixed that and right back where I started. So, whatever. Okay, the, uh, I can't tell you how good it feels to know where you're going, to enjoy the trip to get there, and be able to look back on an accomplishment and say, wow. Taking that same concept into your trio activities, just to take it from more important personal into that, where's your chapter going? What are you doing this year? Well, I don't know, we haven't had our meetings yet. When you get to the meeting, what's your suggestion? What are you going to come out of that with? What can you do different or better than you're doing? I don't know because I don't know what our goals are. Ah, uh, duh. Maybe the first thing you want to do is sit down together and determine what should be the goals of your chapter. <coughs> don't try and get 20 of them. 
get two or three that you and your members can get passionate about, and then what's the first thing you do with it? First thing, you got this idea, it's a dream, first thing you're gonna do is what? Write it, write it, write it down. down. That's the secret of success. Every motivational speaker will tell you that, you gotta write it down. Once you write it down, you're gonna turn around and say, what do we have to do to get there? We want to go to Pittsburgh for leadership stuff. What do we have to do to get there? Well, we've got to do this, this, and this. Okay, who wants to help with this? And so somebody says, all right, I'll, get, I'll bring the coffee. I'll bring the donuts. Okay, we've got a meeting going on to support candidates, for example. We need some money for that. How much money do we need? Well, you know, we should get lunch. Okay, how many people are we going to bring? Well, 25. And he's going to bring a caregiver with him? Yeah, so we've got 50 people to feed at lunch. How much does that cost? I don't know. Somebody says, well, a box lunch is about 10 bucks. All right, we need $500. Where are we going to get $500, you asked? We reach out. Okay. And in this particular case, we have an ice cream from the farmer. We're going to do that in spades. We can mistake you. We're going to get box lunches, though. <laughs> and so that's the process, and that's the challenge I leave with you. Opportunity for questions. How do you apply that here? Anybody want to ask a question about it or share an experience where you set a goal and found out that it worked? I think my husband just got in through the listing process and the transplant. That was a biggie right there. That was pretty all consuming for a while. Now, <laughs> trace that back for a minute. What was the dream that she was turning into a goal that that was an action step for? What was the dream? What was the dream? Transplant, getting a transplant. I, I don't think that living, was the living, living with him for more years. <laughs> yes. In some cases, that would not be the goal. <laughs> You'd say, good luck. You mean it? <laughs> Luckily, they had a relationship that she said, you know, hey, I'm not through with you yet, John. And so we're going to do what we can. And by the way, we learned the transplant will extend his life beyond the failing life he's having right now. He had a life in front of him. Maybe it was only six months long. She said, that's not enough. I want you for more. And he said, I want you too. And so they started doing the thing, turned that dream, which really corresponded to your values, into the action step, which is getting listed and doing all the things that are associated with that. Okay? You see how you're backing that up into what's really at the root? And I'm going to tell you the passion for that value is what really drove them, and they're here today celebrating. How many months are you out? Seven. Seven months out with new lungs. Out of the wheelchair. <laughs> and the wife that hasn't stopped smiling since she got here. Okay? <laughs> That's his motivation. Yes, Paul? Um, I kind of do what you're talking about already. I, I call it to do this. <clears throat> I set uh, short-term goals as well as long-term long -term goals. Exactly. I'm sorry, that's a good point. You do have things that are going to happen within the next six months to a year. Those are your short-term goals. But look out longer, five years. I don't know if you want to look out ten years. You've got retirement, things like that. Put them in there. But that makes very close targets that are more actionable, maybe. But even if you look out ten years, and you're talking, for example, retirement. You're working, and that's within the window, and you want to retire? You put that down, and now there are things you're going to have to do to have the finances to be able to make that happen, right? And so things that happen this year are supporting something that's going to happen 10 years from now. Good point. Thank you, Paul. Can, can I add? Yeah. Um, my, my recent short-term goal, I just uh, got through it. Um, but the reason for my voice is the way it is, this is a normal, um, my voice has degraded and I noticed it in the spring and I thought it was just allergies and it, it turned out that it wasn't. I, I had a, a, my annual visit with my liver doctor, a liver transplant in October 5th, uh, 2002. And my anniversary is coming up soon. So, uh, I mentioned to my liver doctor uh, that my voice is degraded. Right away, he said, I want you to see an ENT. And he said, sometimes we see this with uh, uh, 
recipients that have been, have been out for a long time. I'm, a, I'm not a smoker or anything like that. Um, so, you know, the immunosuppressants, when you're on them that long, can cause other issues, which, which it has with me. Um, well, I uh, went to an ENT and here, uh, she put I probed it in my throat with a video camera. It was actually very cool, and now I was able to see. My wife was sitting there, and she saw it live, and she played it back. Um, the video of what she was looking at got my throat. And it, was, it looked like a wart on my vocal cord. It was a white mass, a lesion she referred to it as. So that was in like July. August, I, I had throat surgery, and then at the follow-up, uh, well, the surgery, she cut it off, okay. and, then, and then the follow-up in August, uh, another spot was found right next to where she just removed. So I had another surgery where she cut it off, and then again on the follow-up, there was another abnormal area she kind of was aware of. She saw it during the operation, but she said, I didn't want to cut it uh, out because it, she just took a, a biopsy of it and it came back. All these came back as cancer. And in my family, my mother and several aunts, can't, I've lost many family members uh, due to cancer. And my mother died at 56. Two of her sisters died at 56, and I'm 56. So I'm not really superstitious like that, but that was my short-term goal, to make it to September 15th, because that's my birthday. I'm now 57. <laughs> so that was a short-term goal that I made. And uh, the third spot that was found just Wednesday, she used laser treatment to uh, actually, when they went in with the video camera to, to, it was playing laser, it looked great. There was no spot, the, the vocal cord looked normal. They had to actually pull up old images, and, and I'm sitting there, and, and then the biopsy came back cancer, but there are two doctors in the room saying, I don't see anything wrong with it. The other doctors agreed, and I got this thing done. Up, actually, up my nose and down. Too much saying, Well, that biopsy <laughs> came back cancer. I want you to shoot somewhere. <laughs> I don't want to do this yeah, again. Yeah. And and they pulled up. And, and they were planning on it. <clears throat> they pulled up old images and laser where the spot used to be that was gone. The color was good. Everything looked good. So hopefully that was the last one. Well, we're so glad you're here with us with that very sexy voice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and hearing such a I don't know positive about that. story. Bob? You can build diamonds or something. How many years ago it was, but I started to say, when I get to be 75, I'm going to start counting for my old age. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Let me just add one last thought to this. Uh, what they've discovered is our mind really can't distinguish between what's real and what we imagine. And if you've ever had a very exciting dream, you know what I'm talking about. You wake up, your heart's pounding, <laughs> everything's happening because your body thought that was real. There is a documented case as one example of this, and there's many examples of it. A guy got locked into a boxcar, a refrigerated boxcar, overnight, banged on the side, couldn't get any attention, and being in the refrigerated boxcar, he froze to death. They found him in the morning. Okay, he knew it was a refrigerated box car. What he didn't know was it wasn't on. It never got freezing in that car. But his body knew it was being frozen inside a refrigerated box car, and he died of exposure. That's how powerful that is. And so, when you set yourself a goal, what Anthony Robbins would tell you is: close your eyes and make a movie of it and just let it become as real as you possibly can. You want to put it in color, you want to bring the image up front, and the reverse of that is, if you have a phobia, 
And I was at a workshop one time that the, the fellow facilitating the workshop was a practitioner of neuro-linguistic. And part of that is a way to talk to the mind. And one of the breaks, he said, you know, for example, if anybody here has a phobia, if you want to stay behind while we take the 15-minute smoke break, you know, I can help you get rid of that phobia in five minutes. People lived their whole lives. One guy was afraid of heights. We were up on the 13th floor of a motel overlooking the Atlantic Ocean in Maryland. And so he stayed behind. Somebody else had an absolute fear of roadkill, you know, a dead animal on the side of the road. She would go bananas if that would happen. Uh, I think there was a third one. I can't remember what her situation was. But anyway, I said, would you mind? I'm fascinated with NLP. And I would love to see this. She says, up to that. And so uh, they said, sure, go ahead and sit and watch, you know. And he said, OK. And he sat there while everybody was out, out, out on the balcony of the 13th floor uh, and said, all right, here's what I want you to do. Close your eyes. Don't tell me what your phobia is. Uh, we discussed it later. And I just want you to go through and see that situation. And then he worked him through an exercise which took about three minutes of making that image black and white and making a real distant image. Because now what I want you to do is create another Make that a movie. Go through it. Now, rewind it. I want you to instead, this time, see the goal, what you want. Okay? And so, for example, the guy who was afraid of heights, he envisioned himself going up to the height and not being afraid. So I, I want you to see that in color. I want you to bring that close to you so you can see it right there. And they just replayed that in his mind like three or four times. He said, okay. Open your eyes. I thought it was almost hypnotic, <coughs> just the way he relaxed them. Jackie, you can probably understand what I'm saying here. Just talking, he had the right voice, just monotone, talking them through it. About three minutes later, he said, okay. He said, now, how do you feel? Okay. He said, how could we prove that it's gone? The guy got up, walked out of that living room environment, out onto the balcony, 13 stories up, and was just like, oh my god, I don't feel any fear. You can imagine the rest of the crowd when he took his leg over the balcony <laughs> to, to prove to himself that it was gone. They said, well, what are you doing? She said, no. <laughs> he couldn't wait to go home to take his daughter to this restaurant, top of the uh, tower restaurant that his daughter always wanted to go to. But he couldn't go there because it was too high. And he was going home to take her to dinner up on the revolving restaurant. The woman, okay, she had roadkill. Well, we were on a break and it was off season. so. At lunchtime, we went down just in the area and just not kept up, you know, and didn't we see a dead bird over in the corner? She didn't have it. She went over to it, found out it was a dried up apple. She didn't know that. And she first reacted to it, and she had totally lost her fear of that. That's how simple and powerful the human mind is, replacing your experience with something else that you want. Ron? Yeah. Let me phrase this right. Um, we're talking about goals within our organization set up right. to achieve what we're trying to do. Uh, um, I've worked with a lot of nonprofits as you have, and you set goals, and some of the goals are just excellent. Some of the goals are what? You set goals for a oh. project. But what are they? Well, I'm just taking uh, you know, a no, I, mean, I thought you said realistic, unrealistic. No, I we set a goal. Just, um, Don't worry about the detail. Okay. Go ahead. The goal is, is achievable, yeah. but it depends upon support by the people that are involved with you. And I think my sense is the board of directors and the volunteers and trying to coordinate and get all parties on the same wavelength is the most frustrating thing in the world and trying to get that goal accomplished. So um, I, at times, you just don't know which way to go and it stymies your, your, your efforts to complete this goal. So how do you handle that frustration? Well, let me point out something you just said that I'm gonna say is part of the root of the problem. Yeah. Okay. One, it's not a problem, it's not frustrating, it's not whatever else you said. It's a challenge. A challenge gives a sense of accomplishment, something I can overcome. Oh, we've got this big problem. No, we have a challenge to overcome. 
oh, okay, how are we going to do that? Right? Start changing your mental vocabulary. Talk to yourself in different terms. One, I, I've got a list of those words in my mind. The one that always jumps out at me is the word try. Get rid of that in your vocabulary. You're not going to try it. You're going to do it. Hey, you want to have lunch tomorrow? Oh, yeah, let's try. We're not going to have lunch tomorrow. <laughs> yes, let's set a time of day. Oh, okay, we're going to have lunch tomorrow. Just that little word. In my group at work, what I had them do, if they accidentally used the word try, they got to stand on a seat and like a, 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 like a, a chicken. You know what? That broke the pattern. And once you get rid of the word try, you'll be amazed at what your attitude toward things are. Take away, you don't have problems. You have challenges. It's the same thing, but it's totally different to yourself. A challenge is something I can overcome. Problem, oh God, here we go. And I'm frustrated with this. Well, you're not frustrated. You haven't found the solution yet. Well, oh, that means I'm going to find a solution. But here's the real answer, Ron, yeah. from my perspective, and I'm sure everybody else could have a different answer. I think that's the challenge of leadership. Once you have a goal, to communicate it and get the passion behind it that you feel so that other people feel it. I'm hoping, for example, that by the time we get through here today, you felt the passion I feel about setting goals and achieving them. And if you go away with some of that passion, yippee, I've done it. Okay? And so that's the challenge I'd give you, Ron. Take the skills, the connections, the, all the things you have going for you and attack that challenge with the support of a board that whoever, whether it's you or somebody else, is passionate about and let them see that same vision and get excited about it. And maybe that's only two other people. But you know what? That's why I knew two more people. They're going to do whatever it is. And sometimes it's my passion and I haven't communicated effectively enough. They're not on board, but they Oh, yeah, we'll vote for that. You want to bake bread? Okay. We'll be back when you're cutting the bread. You know, not a problem. I'm passionate. I'd love to do it. And so I do it. I have a good time. If I get somebody else involved, they have a good time, too. But that's optional to my plan. Just one thought. Yes, Mary? Well, First, Mary. <laughs> when Tom knew that he was near the end, he said his biggest mistake was not getting other people involved with all the work that should be done in our chapter. He said, now you don't have to do it, and you can never do a newsletter. To me, that was a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Everything I can, I would do a newsletter. Then I set a new goal. Wait a minute, I'm doing everything. This is not right. Good. So fortunately, I talked Walter and Nancy Hinkle into being co-presidents. Mm -hmm. uh, we still have our same vice president. Uh, in the meantime, we had a president that filled in for Tom, but he developed cancer. Mm -hmm. But he guided me through that transition mm -hmm. period. You and Sylvia kept me involved. And I was wishing for a speaker for our group. Jackie is awesome. Wow. You saw that? Mm -hmm. And Rosie is wonderful. And I she's voting for the donation. She's on dialysis. And she Very formed wonderful. the kidney cats. So cool. She made over $2,000 for life banking. It isn't more fun to have a group involved, engaged with that fashion. Super just, I'm just a grunt. I'm just the one that gets it done. There are people in your organization that aren't the visionaries. They're the ones who just want to do it. Give them the vision and find a place for them to do it. And that'll be about Mary. Well, I was just going to say that I have, um, I carry a notebook around with me everywhere. And it's, you know, things I need, short term things, like just daily things that errands I have to run or whatever, but I also have this lib list, and I'm sure we all have heard of a bucket list, but I didn't like the phrase, and I actually made this lib list before I turned 30, and <laughs> it wasn't things I had to do before I was 30, but just things like I wanted to go on a hot air balloon, and um, I wanted to go to a baseball game, like just simple things that I've never experienced while I was growing up, and I showed the list to um, one of my friends, and he said to me, well, you can't live your life that way. And I said, I said, okay, <laughs> what do you mean? He's like, well, you can't, you can't plan things out in your life. You have to just enjoy now and enjoy the moment. And I was like, okay, but I think you're missing my point. Like, I understand I'm all about here and now, and you have to enjoy the time with your family and friends right now in the present, but it's also like, 
are there things you want to do and aren't there just simple things? It doesn't have to be like run for president or something. I don't know, like something crazy or, but you know, and I just, I thought it was just very interesting to have, I mean, I can understand his perspective and maybe it's my own experiences while growing up. I mean, definitely everyone's experiences are different and impact them in a different way of how they approach life and how they go through life. <coughs> but I just thought that was very interesting to have that mm -hmm. kind of, I don't want to say wall, but I guess perspective of someone just saying that, so we can't live your life that way. I'm like, okay. I'll bet you that she has written down someplace the goal of publishing her book. Yeah. And that was done a couple of years ago, and it's one chapter at a time, and she set a path, one chapter a month. She got herself engaged with a lot of people to comment on it. Another example. 